right now, Kenya this time. The adventure, well, this one's a little different. I'm not going after a storm or a volcano, a hurricane, anything like that. With this adventure, it's what you can't see that'll kill you. I'm off to Africa, to a biological hot zone hidden deep in a mysterious cave. And it may not be the 12,000 pound elephants that I have to worry about. I got a bat, the bad news is it bit me. What do I do now? Elephants are one of the most enduring symbols of Africa. They're also the nexus of an incredible story and my latest adventure. On the wide open African savanna, elephants, like most animals, get their salt by grazing on plants. But high up on Kenya's Mount Elgon, where the salt is washed away from vegetation, the elephants that live there get this vital dietary mineral from the salt-rich caves found on the mountainside. For thousands of years, these pachyderms have mined the pitch-black caves in search of salt and tusked away at the walls, actually enlarging the caverns. The massive caves became a habitat for numerous creatures, including thousands of bats. One of these species, the Egyptian fruit bat, has been linked to Marburg hemorrhagic fever, a lethal disease related to the Ebola virus. Two people died of Marburg after visiting these caves. I decided that with the proper preparation, that I could explore these African caves myself. Now, you may not have even heard of Marburg hemorrhagic fever. It's a very, very close cousin to Ebola and has a lot of the very same symptoms, uh, fever, body aches, and eventually you just your body breaks down and you bleed out. So it has a very high mortality rate, between 50 to 90%, and this is not something that I want to come in contact in this cave. So it's something that we're really going to have to be careful of, uh, not only the potential of wildlife in the cave, but the cave is actually unstable, there are collapses that happen quite often, and then of course you've got the Marburg and a variety of other diseases that can be found in the bats of this cave. On this particular adventure, I've got with me Donald McFarland. Now, this guy is a specialist when it comes to caves and cave ecosystems. He knows a lot about bats, he's a bat scientist, and he's actually mapped the caves of Mount Elgon. How many times have you actually been to the caves of Mount Elgon? Two, uh, two summer trips before, 2003, 2005. These are not just regular uh, solution karst caves. Right, these particular caves, uh, in large part, have been developed by the action of animals uh, removing some of the volcanic ashes for their salt concentration. And of course the largest, those most spectacular of those animals are the elephants. This is the not so smooth road to the Masai Mara Game Reserve, which is a very good place to get up close to some of the incredible African wildlife. Few places on Earth can match Kenya for its extraordinary diversity of wildlife. The tall, the sleek, and the powerful, all surviving on one land, adapting to changes in climate and food supply. And sometimes, survival requires an act of daring. The great migration across the Mara River. It's one of the most spectacular sights in all of nature. The wildebeest and the zebra, they cross this river twice a year. They do this cycle and they follow the rains as the rains move from one area to another. And they'll get up close to the river and they'll just sit and wait. 
until so one of them gets enough courage to finally step in and start to swim across, and then they all follow the leader, and sometimes hundreds, thousands at a time. This massive migration is a life and death struggle. Most of the animals make it across, but some are not so fortunate, falling prey to the vicious rapids or hungry crocodiles. There are few places in the world where you can experience such incredible beauty and intense danger at the same time. This graveyard of wildebeest skeletons is a really dramatic example that shows how much peril these animals face when they're doing their annual migration. Today was spent observing the elephants and other animals on the wide open African savanna. Tomorrow, I'll take on the microbiological risks hidden deep in Kittim Cave. I've traveled to Kenya where I'm about to embark on an exploration of the fascinating Kittim Cave, high up on Mount Elgon. But there are gonna be some obstacles. We got a lot of rain last night. The mountain road up there is probably gonna be very interesting. Okay, so let's get going. All right. My guide for this expedition, biologist Donald McFarland, has studied these caves extensively and will be an invaluable resource on this trip. If we ever get there. The mountain road is horrendous. And if my track record with four-wheel drives is any indication, this is really bad. It's pouring rain. Cold. We're up at about 8,000 feet. And this truck is well and truly bogged in. One of the big problems is if we go any further over to the right, we tumble down this cliff. But with a large dose of local help, we're finally out of the mud. As part of Don's research, he mapped the entire cave, which will be useful during our exploration. Right, so here's where the elephants come in and they tusk just at the back mainly? It seems like most of the activity is at the back of the cave, so it's a distance of maybe 200 meters or so. I guess if they keep going back over and over again, even in complete darkness, they'd learn the route and just sort of find right. their way to the back of the cave. They know one route, exactly. they know it well, then they just keep repeating that over and over again and then Exactly. takes them to the right place. The question now is, will the elephants return to the caves while I'm there? The trek is steep, and as usual, I'm not exactly traveling light. With pitch black caves and no electricity, this is the best power solution. The first biohazard we encounter is Leishmaniasis, a nasty, sometimes fatal skin disease spread by sand flies that live on the hyrax, a small mammal that nests at the cave entrance. Our eagle-eyed biologist spots a nest right away. There's a hyrax just running across those. It just, just ran ab above where it... Yeah. Well, we've got hyrax droppings coming down here. These are old ones. And the actual hyrax nest is back under this rock here. And we can see some fresh droppings in there as well. So this is a 
prime sandfly habitat. Those are the creatures that the sand flies are attracted to, and it's the sand flies that cause the leishmaniasis. So if you were afraid of catching leishmaniasis, this would be the absolute worst place to be standing. The very worst. It's thought that poachers may have driven the elephants from the cave, but as we enter, Don and I find evidence to the contrary. Fresh elephant droppings. Oh, this is an important discovery. We thought that maybe the elephants hadn't been visiting the cave in months, perhaps even years, but this is absolute proof that they've been here probably within the last week. Three, four days? Yeah. That's important, wow. Looks like the Mount Elgon elephants might be making a comeback. This protective gear will keep us from being bitten by potentially diseased creatures. Inhaling toxic bat urine. Or suffering head injuries from cave collapse or elephant tramplings. Okay, I think we're ready. Another day at the office. Kidam Cave on Mount Elgon in Kenya is a unique geological feature carved by giant elephants that enter these caverns in search of salt. Right, you have the elephants come up onto this collapsed pile and then track around and get round to the back of the cave where they're, they're working at the, the back wall. It's amazing they come in this deep. Imagine a 12-foot high, 12,000-pound pachyderm maneuvering on this terrain. How can an elephant, or any animal by that matter, come in here when it's completely dark and navigate through this cave? It's unbelievable. They must just feel their way through. OK, this is pretty cool. So these are the tusking marks. Yep, scrapes from the tusks, all the soft rock being removed. They're everywhere, this whole wall. Don explains how years of elephants tusking away at the salt-rich volcanic deposits in these walls have caused erosion and ultimately cave collapse. Elephants have been scraping away above and around and beneath. Sooner or later, this will drop off and join the rest on the floor. As we venture deeper into the cave, we cross treacherous piles of unstable rubble from a recent cave-in. I come across several animal remains in the deep recesses, such as the skull of this buffalo, who may have fallen in the inky blackness or been attacked by hyenas or other predators. Although we find evidence of big game animals throughout the cave, I want to see if we can encounter some firsthand. So I convinced Don to go along with another of my crazy ideas. As if it isn't wild enough just coming to this cave, the next part of the plan is to set up camp and spend the night, see if we can spot any of the wildlife that sometimes comes here. Bye-bye, guys. See you in the morning. The cameraman is gone. The porters are gone. We're going to stay the night in Kidham Cave. Be one long night. It's gonna be a long night. That's the understatement of the day. As night falls, we prepare as best we can. Here's our little makeshift campsite. Don's already trying to get some sleep. He'll be on watch later. The light will soon be fading, and then It'll be nothing but complete darkness, the sound of the waterfall, and the sound of the bats. And even they'll leave at night. We sleep in shifts, as we have no idea what predators might enter the cave. But the thought of being attacked by a leopard or hyena in the middle of the night means neither of us are likely to get a decent rest.
The night in the cave went smoothly, but uh, was somewhat uneventful, at least as far as I can tell. We didn't see any elephants. We didn't hear any big game come in, but it was so dark that uh, you couldn't really tell if anything had come in. And with the waterfall trickling nearby, it's hard to hear any sounds. Maybe something came in last night, walked right past us. We would have never known. So it's all a great mystery right now. In the morning, the crew returns with fresh battery power, which we'll need for the next part of this exploration. The huge bat roost at the very back of the cave. Dawn leads the way and introduces me to all kinds of weirdness. This is nasty with a capital N. This whole crease in here is full of these parasitic insects that feed off the blood of these bats. These insects could be carrying the deadly Marburg virus that killed two visitors to this cave. But how do all these creatures survive in such a forbidding environment? What we have here is a unique microclimate with the heat of the bat's bodies generating enough heat to make the walls about 14 degrees centigrade higher than the rest of the cave. And along with much higher humidity, we've got a microclimate that will support all kinds of insects and these parasites and so on that uh, don't occur anywhere else in the cave. cut across over the top of the collapse pile, and then there's a bat colony over the far side that we can uh, get to. OK. As we move closer to the roost, the going gets tougher. Huge boulders remind us of the certain death that awaits anything caught in a roof collapse. I'm trying to get deep up inside the bat roost right now. As we get closer, the sound of the bats is incredible. And then we see them. Thousands of glowing eyes. Let's get closer. The moment we turn on our lights, they take off, flying out by the hundreds. Oh, wow. Don and I want to get a closer look at them, so we attempt to catch one. Easier said than done. In all the confusion, I make what could be a fatal mistake. I got one! Stop! Oh. Got a bat. The bad news is it bit me. Oh. What a major screw up. I can't believe. I can't believe I didn't think about these bats biting me. I really should have taken better precautions. You can be as prepared as you possibly can and still just absentmindedly forget something so simple, so basic. Stop! That has potentially dire consequences. What do I do now? Come to Africa to explore the mysterious Kitam Cave, high up on Mount Elgon in Kenya, where thousands of bats swarm around us. 
These bats are potential carriers of several fatal diseases, including Marburg hemorrhagic fever and rabies. And I've just been bitten by one. So these are the Egyptian fruit bats that are common to these caves. I just uh, had a bit of a panic because when I was catching the one that I had, it bit through my glove. Stupid me, didn't put my thicker gloves on until it was too late. And now I've got a million thoughts racing through my mind. This sucks. Like, I'm totally paranoid now. Three distinct possibilities. Number one, nothing will happen, I'll be fine. Possibility number two is I get rabies, which I'm not pre-vaccinated for because there's a shortage of the vaccine. And then the worst scenario, which is scenario number three, is I may have possibly contracted Marburg hemorrhagic fever. Within about a week, you develop a headache, pains, fever, then you start to bleed out. Your insides turn to goo, and then you go into a coma and die. And I'm, it's my, I feel physically sick right now at the prospect of, of maybe having contracted this. I'm more scared now than I am in a big hurricane or up close to a tornado. It's the microbiological stuff that you can't see that really scares the hell out of me. Needless to say, it was a worrisome trip home. The prospect of contracting any of these illnesses is beyond horrifying. Although I try to be as prepared as possible for my adventures, could it be that my biggest threat so far comes from something I can't even see? By the time I reach home, the threat of Marburg has diminished, but I'll still need to undergo a series of rabies vaccinations. But what other unseen dangers could I have been exposed to in that cave?